uh, my wife and I and some of our team are here as well. Uh, we, we served in Birmingham for many years at an incredible church. And, and since that God was calling us to step out and in, in, plant a church in Nashville. And um, man, just watching you guys um, has just really been an inspiration for us. And um, I just I felt the need to share that. You just never know um, who you're inspiring or, or how you are inspiring them. And to see you guys step out on faith, obey God, um, that's inspired us to do the same. Um, God will call people into your life, even from afar, who, who will be able to make a deposit in your life at the time that you need it the most. And um, I just want to tell you guys, I sense that God is doing something incredible in this church. It is not normal. It is not regular. Um, you guys are excellent. The, the, the dream team, absolutely phenomenal. And so I'm excited to be here. I'm your cousin from Nashville. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm officially a part of the family. And uh, we're excited to hop into the word today. Let's go to the book of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah. And uh, I want to read two verses to get us started today. And um, your, your pastor said, I am a hollaback preacher. Uh, and so I want y'all to, to talk to me. You know, if, I, if I'm preaching really good, take your shoe off and just throw it up here. Well, boy, preaching so good made me hit him with my shoe. No, please don't do that. Um, it may hurt. <laughs> but no, talk back to me. Because here, here's, here's the truth. If, if you talk back to me, like, it'll make me preach faster. You got me? And so we'll, we'll get home in time to watch some football. So if I say something good or not, just act like I do, and then we can get through this and go home. Amen? <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 2, uh, we're in verses 4 uh, and 5. Here's what it says. The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah, where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Before you take your seat, will you look at somebody next to you? And I just want you to speak this over your life. Say, neighbor, you were born to build. Come on, give God one more hand clap of praise as you take your seats. You were born, you were born to build. I want that to be somewhat of a, a declaration for you uh, over the course of the next week or so that, that you were born, you were born to build. There's something that God has called you to do. There's something that God has, has called you to accomplish. I was honored when Pastor Michael invited me uh, to, to help kick off this collection of, of messages. And as I was praying about our time together and, and what the Lord would have me to share, uh, I started thinking about how, uh, about Almost three months ago, uh, my family and I moved from Birmingham to Nashville. How many people just love moving? That's so fun, right? <laughs> and uh, like, like you, I absolutely love moving. I mean, I just, I can't wait to move again. It's literally at the top of my list of things to do is move. I want to pack all the boxes, and I want to have to fold up all the clothes, and I want to have to break down all the furniture. Because the only thing that's more fun than breaking the furniture down at your old place is trying to figure out how to put it back together at your new place. If you're anything like me, you, you don't use the instructions. Why? Because why would I need instructions when I could just look at the picture on the box? I think this goes right there. No, right. no, no. Nope, nope. and, and here's the part that irritates me the most. I'm sorry. I'm going to be for real in a minute. But the part that irritates me the most is it's like you'll get to like the third step and do it wrong. And then you'll get to like step seven and then realize you did step three wrong. And so now you got to undo seven through three and do that over. I, I, was, I was setting our furniture back up at our, our new house in, in Nashville and um, the instructions – call for me to use a screwdriver to put together this particular piece of furniture. And because I'm witty and smart and intelligent, I couldn't find a screwdriver. <laughs> so instead, I did what anybody with good sense would do. 
Come on, brother. You, you've done it. Don't look at me like that. I did what anybody with good sense would do. I couldn't find the screwdriver, so I just picked up butter knife. Because after all, they're basically the same thing. The only problem is, is that a screwdriver was called and created to be a screwdriver. And a butter knife was called and created to be a butter knife. And just because the butter knife can do what the screwdriver can do does not mean that it was called or created or crafted to do what the screwdriver does. In, in fact, in fact, if you if you open the silverware drawer in, in our kitchen right now, you'll see a bunch of butter knives that are missing their tips. <laughs> you know why? Because eventually when you misuse something, you end up abusing something. And so now there, there, are, there, there are several knives in our kitchen that are missing their tips because I used them for something that they could do instead of using it for something that it was created to do. And, and, and I know we're laughing, but, 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 but seriously, folks, or should I say spiritually, folks, is it possible that some of us are walking through life broken in certain areas because we've grown comfortable doing some things just because we can do it, although if the truth is told, it is not what we were created to do. See, see, when you, when you, see, see, see sometimes we allow people to do this to us, and, and because we don't want to upset people, we don't want to disappoint people, then we will allow them to push us and to prod us into doing things that we can do, but we know it's not what we were created to do. But more tragically than that, sometimes we do this to ourselves. When we choose to go through life and we make our lives about the things that we can do instead of making our lives about the things that we're called to do. And as a result, just like my butter knives, we end up broken in certain areas. Finances broken because, because I, I made my financial life all about how much money I could get and how high on the corporate ladder I could, I could crawl and climb only to end up with a bank account that is full and a heart that is empty of joy. I can climb this corporate ladder, but is that the only thing I'm called to do? Was that the only thing I was created to do? Or perhaps is there more that God wants to do in my life? And I stopped by at the last service to get you to understand that there is more that God wants to do in your life. I'm proud of what you accomplished. We are glad to see how, God, how far God has brought you, but there is more that he wants to do in your life. There is purpose on your life. Look at your neighbor telling me there's purpose on your life. All right, that was a hater. Find another neighbor. I'm sorry, you sat next to a hater. Find somebody else, tell them there's purpose on your life. Look at the person behind you, tell them it's purpose on your life. And for the next 25 minutes, while this boy up there preaching, I'm going to irritate you because God called me to sit next to you at this service so you would not be comfortable settling for a life that is less than what God has called you to be. That's less than what God has called you to do. No, there is purpose. There is calling. There is anointing. There's something unique on your life and you sat next to the wrong person because I I will not allow you to settle for anything less than what God has called you to be. Somebody shout, I got purpose. It's purpose. It's purpose on my life. It's purpose on my life. And, and, and this word purpose is, is easily defined. This word purpose is easily defined. It, it's defined as the reason for the existence or creation of a thing. So before a thing was created, there was a reason or a rationale behind why it was created. 
So before someone created the screwdriver, they realized that they had a problem that needed to be solved. That if they were going to put stuff together in a way that would cause it to stick and be sturdy and stable, then I need to assist the building process by inventing a tool that helped me build it strong. They had a problem. And so something had to be created because purpose is always the answer to a problem. I just set you up for that. So you know what? You're not just a person. You know what you are? You're an answer. You are an answer to a problem. There's some problem going on in the earth right now, and God allowed you to be born for such a time as this, at a time like this, because he intends to use you as an answer to a problem. There are problems in your family, but guess what? You're the answer. Problems in the community, but guess what? You're the answer. Maybe God put the Becoming Church in the heart of Michael and Katie, and he called you into this room because there's problems in Madison. And guess what? You're the answer. Because, because purpose is always an answer to a problem. I didn't say this at the first service, and it's going to keep me up at night. Purpose is God's invitation to his creation and their participation in the eradication of a certain problem. I'm going to say that again. Purpose is always God's invitation to his creation for their participation in the eradication of a certain problem. And there's problems in the earth because God's waiting on you to walk in purpose. It's purpose. Somebody shout purpose. Pur pur purpose is always the reason for the existence or creation of a thing. And in today's text, I believe we meet a man who's walking in purpose. His name is Nehemiah. And when we find him in Nehemiah 1, verses 1 and 3, this is what the Bible says. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year. While I was in the citadel of Susa, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. And they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. One of the most pressing questions that we've got to answer during our time together today is because there's multiple people, multiple types of people in the room. Some of you are in the room and you're saying, Pastor Hollis, all of what you just said sounds so good. I mean, it's really cute. But I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what my purpose is. And can I suggest to you that maybe you should do the same thing Nehemiah does? He starts asking some questions, and when he asks some questions, we see that he looks around and he listens up. And if purpose is the answer to a problem, then sometimes that means that when you find a problem, you've also found your purpose. But in order to find problems, you got to look around. And you got to listen up. Maybe some of us have not walked in the purpose that God has called us to because we're so caught up in our own lives and everything that we're doing is only about us and what we can get and what we can drive and where we can vacation and, 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 and how many promotions we can get. No, you need to look around and listen up. There's problems around you and those problems might be a gateway to your purpose. What frustrates you? What, what, what bothers you? I mean, you ever been bothered by something? I mean, just like really just bothered. Maybe it irritated you in such a way because God was inviting you to get involved in this solution. And so if you're here and you're like, well, Pastor Alice, I, I really want to get into this message that you're, that you're sharing. I, I, I really want to lean in, but, but I just I don't know how it applies to my life because I don't know what my purpose is. Look around and listen up. Many times I, I, I believe that, that your misery becomes your, your ministry, that many times what you struggle with in one season, God intends to use you to solve in another season. And so sometimes you've got to look around you and say, what did I struggle with in the past? Maybe that's something that God is calling me to solve in the future. He looks around 
and, and he listens up. And the Bible says in, in, in verse 4 that when he heard these things, he sat down and he wept. Why? Because purpose and vision always starts off as a burden. Purpose always starts off as a burden, something that's burdening you, something that's bothering you, something that's keeping you up at night. Many times, that's the way purpose starts. Here's the part that I love, because not only are there people in the room who are saying, well, I, I don't know what my purpose is, there's other people in the room who are saying, I know what my purpose is, but I don't know how to get started with it. I don't know how to walk into it. So I've got purpose, thank you, but I don't know how to pursue it. I, 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 I got some idea of maybe how God intends to use me, but I don't really know how to get started, how to get moving in that direction. Look at what Nehemiah does when he starts catching a picture of his purpose. The Bible says in Nehemiah 1 and 4 that when he heard these things, he sat down and he wept. And for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed. Why is that important? Because don't just chase purpose, chase God. Don't, don't just chase purpose. I need you to chase God. There are too many people. I've made this mistake of chasing after purpose without first chasing after God. And can I tell you, when you start pursuing purpose and you start building the career and building the family and building the podcast and helping to build up the church, there are going to be some problems that are going to make you want to quit. And you will clock out of purpose if you have not first clocked into prayer. Did you hear what I just said? You will clock out of purpose if you have not first clocked into prayer. I said this at the earlier service. Me, I, I really love Pastor Mike, but we're going to fight. Me and Pastor Mike are going to fight. He's a big dude, so I might need some help. I didn't think that through earlier. He is a little bigger than me. Wow. We got to fight, though. We started building a relationship maybe last year sometime, and, and we've had an opportunity to be in some similar spaces and, and start to communicate and, and share ideas and, and all. I'm so grateful for what I sense that God is, is, is building between the two of us. But, but he didn't tell me how hard planting a church was. <laughs> I mean, we, we got to be, be, I thought we were better than this. Like he, I, I met him, we were in Birmingham at a conference, he's like, hey man, so proud of you. Go out there and get him. <laughs> you got it, go kill him. You're going to do, oh man. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> and, I, and, I'm, and I'm tripping, why? Because three months, four months, five months, six months into this church planning journey, I'm like, yo, this is hard. This is tough. Can I tell you the honest truth? Can I tell you the truth? We cool, right? If I had not pursued God first, if I hadn't pursued God first, I would have quit already. You know how many times I've wanted to quit ministry? You know how many times, okay, you'll feel me on this one. You know how many times I've wanted to quit life? Like you ever just wanted to retire from life? It's like, I'm just going to go live in the woods. Just leave me alone. <laughs> and many of you have felt that way before, but you've been able to keep fighting towards who and what God has called you to be. Not because you've dotted every I and crossed every T. Not because you've had everything you needed at every turn, but you've been able to keep fighting and to keep going. Why? Because you chose to pursue God before you chose to pursue purpose. I am not going to chase after what God called me to do without first chasing after the God who called me. And if we're not careful, we will allow culture to cause us to become a group of people who love what we were created for more than we love who we were created by. If we're not careful. We will allow culture to create in us, to force us to become a people who love what we were created for more than we love who we were created by. Yeah. 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 See, your pursuit of purpose has to first be anchored in your time with God. Yeah. 
It has to be first be anchored in your pursuit of God. So don't just chase purpose, chase after God. Because can I tell you something? It's going to be some days while you're walking in purpose that you wish you weren't. It'll be days where, where truth be told, you'll be like, this is, this is God really? Really God? Oh, really? And if you're not first anchor, we, we, I'm, I'm, I'm very old school. I'm, I mean, I'm, I promise you I am. We used to sing this song in the old school church. My grandmother would sing it. It, it went something like this. My soul's been anchored in the Lord. It paints a mental picture that when life starts coming at me from all possible sides, when the wind starts blowing and the waves start coming, because there's an anchor below the surface that you don't see, you don't even understand how all of this is going on around me, but I'm still stable. I'm still standing. Why? Because there's something below the surface. You didn't see me praying. You didn't see me in worship. You didn't see me in my word. But just because you didn't see it doesn't mean that it wasn't happening. I've been anchored. Anchored. I'm anchored in something. And because I've been anchored in something, when life starts happening, I'm able to keep standing. There's this weird, this weird sentence at the end of, of, of verse 11, Nehemiah 1 and 11, that really kind of blows my mind. Nehemiah starts talking about, hey, I'm praying, and God, I need you to hear my prayer, and, and I want you to open the, the ears of the people that I'm going to. I want you to be with me and, and cover me and keep me. But then at the end, this one little sentence messes me up. He says, I was cupbearer to the king. Look at it. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today. By granting him favor in the presence of this man, I was cut bare to the king. This weird little curveball out of nowhere, and I was wrestling and praying like, God, why is that there? And I really believe that the Lord spoke to me, and I want to share with you what he said to me. Here's why. Because God's plan for your life might interfere with man's plan for your life. Pastor Hollis, what do you mean? Ne Nehemiah, it would appear as though he has some sort of plan for his life. He says it right there. I was cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah, what do you do? I'm cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah, what's your purpose? I'm cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah, what's your plan for life? To become the best cupbearer to the king. I want to be the LeBron James of cupbearers. <laughs> I mean, I want to be the greatest cupbearer of all times, LeBron James. <laughs> <laughs> he said, now nah, I'm going to get the shoe. <laughs> I want to be, be, be the greatest cupbearer of all time. That's the plan. That's my purpose. That's, that's what I want to do. Uh-oh. Because Nehemiah has a plan for his life. And it would appear as though God's plan and his plan aren't the same. Because if you live long enough, eventually God's plan for your life will interrupt your plan for your life. God's plan for your life will eventually interrupt your, just keep, it hasn't happened yet, but keep living. It'll happen. We were getting ready to buy a house in Birmingham. A year and a half ago, we were going to buy a house in Birmingham. I, and I was bragging about it. Fellas, y'all know how we do. I'm going to buy your house, girl. <laughs> yeah, I got you, little baby. Uh-huh. <laughs> buy your little house a little something, you know. Not, some slight. <laughs> slight. Just a little house, you know. Yeah, Christmas at our house this year. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling myself. Yeah, you glad you stuck with me then, uh-huh, yeah, 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 yeah. See, I told you, stay with me, baby, I got you, I got you. And, and in the middle of this process, out of nowhere, God starts knocking on the door of our hearts, saying, move to Nashville. I'm like, hold on, God, wait, <laughs> whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You had a meeting without me? <laughs> We're part of a great church. 
I'm getting invited to preach in all, I mean, all kind of places. I'm meeting people that, you, I mean, you know how to, I'm meeting the people that I've always wanted to meet. I'm, I'm rubbing shoulders with people and things are going well. Great church, growing, and I'm getting ready to buy this girl a house. Like, God, like, I'm really about to be the man around here. And his plan interrupted mine. Or, uh oh, singles, 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 singles. You know, when you meet somebody, I mean, and they. It, you know. And you get on the phone, girl, he, he fine. He ain't just fine. He's so fine. Oh, my girl. Oh. Oh, my God. And I was at the last service because, you know, normally I go to the first service, but I came to the last service, and he was at the last service. I think he on, like, the safety team or something. Like, oh, my God. He loved God, and he fine. <laughs> Girl, I'm never going to that first service again. I'm only going to the last service. You got to come with me next week because you got to see him. Some brother, I'm helping you out. You in this service right now, and you owe me, like, big. Because I'm putting you on. It's like when my, when my wife met me on the campus of Miles College. She didn't say I was fine. She saw me with my Denzel walk. She said, oh, that boy's so fine. Right? You ever just met somebody? You, just, you, you knew for sure that th that was it. That this is the girl. This is the guy that God wants me to be with. And you are so ready. I mean, just so ready. Like, too ready. Like, dehydrated, thirsty, calm down. <laughs> And, 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 and you were so ready, and then God said, nope, not it. And you're like, girl, you'll never let me do what I want to do. <laughs> because eventually, God's plan for you will interfere with your plan for you. And so faith is not just believing God for what you want. Faith is believing God for what he wants for you. And I wonder, do you have the type of faith that allows an open invitation for God's interruption in your life? That God, if you want to interfere with what I have planned, then you can have your way because I want what you have planned for me. Not just what I have planned for me. Because purpose is often an interruption. Family, we, we got to go, but I want to give you four things really quickly uh, because I want, you to, I want you to pray about your purpose. Right. I want, I want prayer to be the way you filter through your purpose. And here's four ways that you can pray for your purpose. The Bible says in Nehemiah four, Nehemiah two, verse four and five. The king said to me, what is it you want? And then I prayed to the God of heaven. And I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. He prays and he tells the king specifically where his purpose is. And so what I want you to do, number one, is pray for the right place. Pray for the right place. Many of you are in this room because you prayed about this room. You, you, you asked God, send me to a church that feels like this and looks like that. I'm looking around this room right now. This, it looks like heaven. You prayed for this. You asked God for a place like this. And now that you're here, don't sit down and get comfortable. Ask God to help you find your place within the place. God, I made it to the place that I asked you for. Now help me figure out what is my place within the place. What team should I be on? Where should I be serving? Where, where can I best lend my influence, my time, my talent, and my treasure? Pray for the right place. We care about the place everywhere else except when it comes to God. Before you bought a house, you cared about the neighborhood. When, when, when you, if, if you're anything like my wife, you, you will look through 100,000 Airbnbs. Because when you go out of town on vacation, you want to find the right place. So why is it all of a sudden with God, the place doesn't matter? And then, and then we try to justify it with church-isms. Well, God, what, what, pastor, wherever you need me. <laughs> Nehemiah 2 and 6, then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take? And when will you get back? 
It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. Now, I I want you to pray about the right place, but I also want you to pray about the right pace. Because purpose has a pace to it. There's a pace to purpose. I I heard this quote once before, bless my life, it's a beautiful quote. It says that if everything is important, nothing is important. And a part of pace is priorities. And if you're going to accomplish the purpose that God has called you to, then you need to start praying to God about your pace. Don't get a picture of your purpose and then feel this pressure from the outside looking in that somehow you've got to accomplish everything that God has called you to do overnight. No, pray and ask God for the right pace. If this is where I'm trying to end up in five years, God, what should I be doing today? Have you ever heard the saying that it takes 10 years to become an overnight success? And if we're not careful, we'll allow comparison Uh Uh-oh, I'm about to help you. We'll allow comparison to make us eavesdrop over into somebody else's life, and we'll become so caught up on what God is doing in their life that we become cynical and ungrateful over what God is doing in our life. And now this unnecessary pressure is on you because you got to be what they are when you don't even know how long it took them to become it. (laughs) Instead, pray for the right pace. God, if it's not time for me to do that part of the plan yet, let me know. I don't want to be where, I don't want to be where you were. I don't want to be where you're going to be. I want to be where you are. What's the pace? Look at verse 7 and 8. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of the trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. Verse 8, and may I have a letter to Asaph. Keeper of the royal park. So he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. Nehemiah prays for the right place. He prays for the right pace, but he also prays for the right provision. God, if I'm going to do this, you call me to do this. This is the purpose that you placed on my life. If I'm going to do this, I'm going to trust that you are going to provide for it. God has called Nehemiah to do something that he has no idea how it's going to work. Nehemiah, I know exactly how you feel. Go plant a church in Nashville. What? How? With what money? With what people? In what building? I've never, I don't know anybody in Nashville, but I called you to it. And if he said that this is the purpose that I have for your life, then I've got to trust him for provision. I'm, I'm trying to hurry. Pro, provision, a beautiful compound word, vision. We know uh, what, what vision is, uh, commonly understood as, as sight, your ability to see. Uh, but, but I really like the, the way we often teach this in, in these spaces is that sight is what you see when your eyes are open. Vision is what you see when your eyes are closed. So there's, when you close your eyes, there's a picture of your life that you see. And what I pray for you today is, is that you see a picture that God is showing you, not a picture that culture is showing you, not a, not a picture that Instagram is showing you, not, not a picture that, that the people who came before you told you should be the picture for your life. I pray that when you close your eyes, you see the picture that God has for your life. But this word provision means, yes, the vision, but this, this prefix pro, meaning before, that, that there was something God was doing before the vision. <laughs> y- y'all, y'all not hearing this. That yes, there's a vision of what God wants to do in your life, but there was something he was doing before the vision to make sure that the vision will actually come to pass. And you've got to trust him that before you ever saw where your life was supposed to be, that he was on the front side working it out for your good. That he was on the front side making sure that the way was made and the path was prepared. Nehemiah says, no, I'm going to trust God for provision. You you, you pray for, for the right place. You pray for the right pace. You pray for the right 
provision. But then lastly, look at verse 17 and 18. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in? Like, stop playing with me. You see it. You see the trouble that we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. They began. Not Nehemiah began. They began the good work. Because after you've prayed for the place and the pace and the provision, you also got to pray about the partners. Why is it with a vision that big, with a purpose that's going to be that impactful, why have you convinced yourself that you're called to do it on your own? No, because the size of your dream should decide the size of your team. And if there's this little small thing that you're believing God for, then perhaps you can do that on your own. But what I'm believing God for is so big, it's so grand, it's so impactful that I got to have somebody else to help me do it. Brother, I know you got a lot of weight on your shoulder. You're leading a family. You're working a full-time job. You're, you, I mean, you're out there. You're, you're, you're building a business on the side, but don't shut your family out. Don't do that. I feel that tugging on my spirit. Why? Because you need the part. And God called them to your life, not just so you could provide for them, but so you could also partner with them. I know there's some friendships in your life that did not go the right way. Don't walk through life saying, no, I'm good. I don't need anybody else. I can do this on my own. No, you need partners. God is in in Genesis in the creation narrative. And the Bible says he creates this and he says, that's good. He creates the birds and he puts them in hair. He says, this is good. He puts the fish in the sea and he says, this is good. He creates Adam and sees Adam by himself and he says, this is not good. It is not good that man should be alone because purpose requires partners. Purpose requires partners. And what I'm praying for you today in these these last few minutes is that, that God would begin to reveal to you your partners. But can I ask you a question? How is it that you're believing God that he would send people to partner with you if you're unwilling to partner with people. Our musicians are, are, are coming, but, but how is it that you're going to pray and ask God to send people to partner with you for your purpose, but you refuse to partner with anybody for theirs? And maybe that's why God called you to the Becoming Church. So you can find a community of people who, who yes, they'll partner with you, they'll pray for you, they'll stand with you in faith. But you could also turn around and do the same thing. That this vision, this tremendous vision for this city, that you could partner with it. You could partner with it. I'm, I'm going to ask really quickly, will you stand to your feet all over the room? All over the room. And I know we all come from different places, different walks of life. But for a moment, I just want you to think about that purpose that God has for your life. You're not here by accident. You're not here by happenstance. You're not just some biological byproduct. You're not just the aftermath of somebody's affection. You're here because God has a plan for your life. You're here because God desires to use you as a part of his grand design. He could choose anyone, but he chose you. And he chose the person that's sitting next to you. See, that's what I love about God. He can choose me and you without having to turn his back on the other. He chose you for your part. And he chose me for mine. But you won't be able to reach purpose 
without the right partner. And yes, that partner is, is people. But can I tell you the greatest partner of all time? His name is Jesus. And 2,000 years ago, he, he hung, died, and bled on a cross called Calvary because he wanted to partner with you. He, he was in heaven and he knew the, the, the plan that God had for your life. And he loved you so much and he realized that you would never be able to fully walk in that plan without his partnership. And so he allowed his body to be beaten and bruised, broken. He allowed himself to be laid in a borrowed tomb. And he stayed lying there dead for three days, but on the third day he rose with all power in his hands because he had a plan to partner with you. He wanted you to live a life that would come alive. He wanted you to become something.